think we should ask them to look at that. If the board wants to see the actual language yourself, I mean, that's certainly your option as well. Okay. Sorry to belabor this point for one time. If you look at the swale, the back of the swale, there is the clay liner. So if you're on the right-hand side of that wall, where you, I think you show a tree or whatever that, that looks like a tree there. If you're on that side, you can repair the wall. But if, you're on, if you want to repair it from the other side, you have to have an easement for whoever owns that other side of the wall. Right, the, um, on the side of the wall, yeah. the proper you need side. Yeah. Add the clay or something, then you yes. need to be able to go over. And is that easement part and parcel of the agreement, so you can get at it from the other side? Yes, it is. It's part of the, the easement is with goes the easement. The 15 foot easement is from here to here, essentially. So, so that whoever, but it's at the responsibility of the owner of the property on the right hand side of that wall that they could actually have an easement to the left hand side of the wall for repair purposes. I know it sounds complicated, but. I don't um, better to sort it out now. It's the Germani's property, so that, that they would be they would be receiving rights to that easement according to the way it's been drafted. So that the people on the lot here, adjacent to the wall, you're right, would be subject. They would be recipient of that easement, correct, Joe? But even so, they even so they'd still have to go to the left hand side of the wall to repair any liner to that wall. And they have which means it's correct. on this. Correct, because they, they, they would have rights to the easement here as well. This is their property here. They would have rights to this land between their property line, including the wall, to the other side of that easement. Yes. Right. Yes. I mean, I'm sorry to belabor it. No, I understand. And, 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 and. Well, now I have a further question. Why would the Germanis be repairing the wall if the wall is on lot 4A? I wouldn't think they would. Okay. But if they had maintenance, if they felt that they had an obligation to get on this lot, but they would do it. The maintenance of the wall, the Primary maintenance of that wall belongs to the lot owner of that lot. Of 4A. 4A. Yeah. And they're obligated to maintain it right. if it's on the site plan, right. right? So if it starts falling apart in 50 years, they're legally obligated to fix it. Right. And, and I'm not an attorney. I don't want to play attorney, but yeah. that would put someone in a situation where does one have a civil suit on that case be a private, you know, that is a private matter if the wall then is actually, if the wall were to deteriorate, if something happened to the wall, and it ended up on their lot, like with any wall, that's, that would be a condition. But anybody down the line of that wall who's not responsible for that part of the wall, but the wall further up the line is leaking, they're going to come down onto their property. Mm -hmm. So if they all don't agree to repair it, then it still could be a problem. And, and, but that's the purpose of the easement. It gives them the rights to go in there, the rights to have access. Well, that's the owner of the property of the right. wall that they're looking at. To my right, if I'm looking at the wall, to my right, there's another part of the wall that may have broken down a bit, and that owner of that land, my right, doesn't want to repair it, then it's going, the water's still going to come down onto my, onto my lot. That's just the nature of Un the wall. Understood. In, in, a, in a unique situation, if that were to happen, but I, I would suggest that if that was the case, my thinking would be the owner of that particular lot would then not be performing to the intent of the drainage easement, not because the, the, the water would, if the wall failed, if something happened on the wall, again, these walls typically don't fail, it's only, you know, two to four feet high. If that failed, the owner of that lot then would not be, would not be caretaking in terms of the it, easement and the drainage itself. So I think and I was the, mistaken when I, yeah. when I thought that the wall belonged, not the end of the, to the party that had the end of it on their property, but mm -hmm. that it was going to be further upstream, and that there was going to be somebody else's responsibility for the whole wall. And, and I look, guess that was where I was mistaken. Okay, looking at the plan, to be clear, when we walked the site the other day, I'm look, using the cursor here up on the, on the screen, the wall will end here, and, and is, instead of going you know, beyond this property line down here, we show the wall ending at the property line. Correct because of the issue of extending that wall, getting easements from the other property owners. So we're collecting, as you saw from the sidewalk, we're collecting as much water as can physically go this way based on topography. Yes, yes. What, yeah. what I want to add is at the bottom of the wall, or I, I have to shut up, I'm sorry, I just yep. will show you. Yep. This, the, the ground is shown here, dropped down, right? Yeah. To Correct. Is a, um, the, the town property. Correct. So the water is going to hit that wall, start running down the inside of the wall, So if there's a problem with the wall on the right, 
the water will come through and then now it will continue on down as it does at the present moment and get everybody wet. So the property owner on the left is going to have, the property owner on the right is going to have responsibility for the property owner on the left. Correct. So, you know, here I am with my wall, it's great, but my, but my neighbor's wall is it's not working well and I'm getting wet and I can't do anything about it. All right, let, let me see if I can help you out here. The wall on lot 4A runs the entire life. There's only one abutter, and that's Mr. Jamani. So there's only one property owner, and he has the easement or the right to come and correct that wall. Right. The other wall kind of just tails off and disappears on lot, on lot 4B. Right, but if it's Mr. Jamani doesn't maintain it, then Mr. Sargent gets water on his lot. Or yeah. If, yeah. If, yes, but he's, he has that responsibility, and Mr. Jamani has the, the right to correct any failure of that of that swale on, on the new lot that we're trying to create. And, I, and there's also a, 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 a that would be a violation of the requirement that that wall be maintained, and so there would be rights right. on that too. Because um, I mean, it seems to me that the wall is very important to this project. Right. You know. Right. So if you don't get all the details worked out beforehand, you could run into legal problems well, later on. It, correct, correct. And, and we, you know, we're making an attempt, and I think it's a, it's a, a major a correction of, of the drainage problem that Mr. Sargent is, is experiencing. Yeah. And Mr. Danini, I mean, Mr. Jamani has expressed a desire to assist also. So I think that uh, the Sargents are going to benefit tremendously by this. Uh, and and as, I, as I did mention, that there's only one property owner that's going to be looking at the, uh, that, that rock wall. Um, and that's the, uh, the people that have an easement to, to correct it if there's something wrong with it. When, uh, excuse me, when, when is this wall erected with regard to development of the lot? When, what comes first, the house or the wall? The wall. We'll do all the site work prior to uh, actual construction. Anybody else have any questions? I had one question, more, I guess it's probably for you, Maureen, on the uh, <clears throat> proposed order that talks about the affordable housing provision, number five. And my question is just whether the last sentence of that item number five is necessary. I was a little concerned because um, I'm sure Mr. Christashi is very familiar with our affordable housing requirements. He's built a couple of houses already. But the ordinance, the mandatory affordable housing provisions allow for the provision of a lot or the provision of a lot with a house on it. Right. And if you are only going to be providing an affordable lot, it has to be sold at the low income price, not the moderate income price. And that's why I added that last sentence. Because it's, it's it, that you're actually getting to what my question was. It seems to me that as that I'm not sure that we have a need to limit that option if there's an option to either sell it at the low income price as a lot. In other words, whatever would comply with the statute, I think. If the applicant wants to go with a different approach, though, I think it needs to be no. Does that need to be decided at this now? time? Because Why? I, because you are attaching a condition that selects either moderate or low income now. Do we have to do that? You really should. Because that, I mean. This My first reaction was, what if the applicant chooses to sell a lot, and is it necessary for us to restrict the applicant to only selling a developed lot as opposed to an undeveloped I, lot? I would suggest, if the applicant really wants to do that, that they should come back and amend this approval and apply the appropriate restrictions to it. Because right now, we're going to be recording a deed restriction that limits it as a moderate income affordable lot with a home on it. Right. And is that... And if Agreeable. you want to just sell the lot for the moderate income home price, we're kind of missing their, you're not meeting the requirements of the ordinance. But I guess my question is, do we need to do anything more now 
and impose a deed restriction on lot three that says that this lot can only be conveyed in accordance with the mandatory affordable housing provisions. Because and the, leave affordable, it to the affordable housing provisions allow for low income and moderate income. Right. And whether you go with the low or mod depends on, I mean, because obviously it's a lot easier to sell a moderate income affordable home because you can charge a lot more for it than a low income affordable home. So applicants will choose one or the other based on frankly, minimizing the burden of meeting this requirement. So large subdivisions tend to go with the low income because they can do fewer lots. Small subdivisions go with the moderate income because it gets a lot closer to the market rate price that they would actually like to be able to charge. Uh, but if, the, if, if this lot is going to be sold without a house on it for the moderate income price, it's not affordable because our pricing is based on a lot with a house on it. Does that make sense? I'm sure it does. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I guess what you're saying is that the way our statute is set up, mm -hmm. we need Mr. Frustacci to dis decide now whether he's going to sell a lot with a house on it or whether he wants to retain the option just to sell the lot undeveloped. Right, in which case he has to sell it at a low income price as opposed to a moderate income price, which is what this restriction is right now. And it's, I mean, to be fair, uh, Mr. Frustashi is probably one of the most familiar developers with the affordable housing requirements, has come before the board in the past to make adjustments. And I would expect he would feel free to come back and amend this approval if for some reason it wasn't working with his plans. So was this the applicant's choice to choose the moderate no, it's up to the planning board, but the, it's up to the planning board. But under the restrictions, the affordable housing requires that 10% of your subdivision has to be affordable to moderate income or 5% of your subdivision has to be affordable to low income. And because Mr. Fustashi is working with, I think right now it's a seven lot subdivision, it's a much lower burden for him to provide one moderate income home than one low income home because we round up. Are you happy with this restriction? Maureen and I discussed it uh, okay. at length, and uh, yes, I'm, obviously I'm here before you. Uh, right. Yeah, this is, this is more than acceptable. Comfortable proceeding with the moderate. Another reason why I wouldn't be comfortable with uh, relinquishing uh, control of uh, the lot at Blueberry Ridge is I built most of those houses in there, and, and I want to maintain the um, uh, the theme that's there, um, want to make sure that the subdivision, uh, the, the infrastructure isn't disturbed by uh, another builder. Um, but I don't think there'd be too many people wanting to buy a lot to build you know, a low income house. Uh, there's no profit in it. So uh, let me lose the money as opposed to somebody else. At least I'll be doing it with with some pride in the of, the of the neighborhood of Blueberry Ridge. So the deed restriction that you refer to, that this language refers to is in fact in the form of this agreement and option to purchase? Yes. <laughs> Which yes. isn't really a deed restriction. I, I presented it to our town attorney and I, I posed the question, is this going to work to do what we need it to do? And he said yes. It functions more like a deed restriction than a purchase and sale agreement, but it is a purchase and sale agreement that would be recorded for Lot 3 prior to recording this subdivision. So it would run with Lot 3. Any conveyance of Lot 3 would trigger this, this restriction. Should we change the wording? Yeah, that's what I'm wondering. If, if rather than re to me, referring to this as a deed restriction is very confusing. I agree. So can we call it? Um, a recorded restriction for lot three of Blueberry Ridge subdivision in a form that runs with the title to the land? That's fine. Okay. <laughs>